Okay, so in this video we'll continue our discussion of uh, microcirculation and lymph. Uh, we will be discussing the topic number three and four, which is the fluid exchange across capillaries. Then we'll move into endothelium derived relaxing factor. The big topic will be topic three. Okay, so let's just review real quick. We talked in the last video about the structure of capillary beds and the passage of substance across the capillary bed. And a quick uh, reminder that the structure of the capillary beds uh, is uh, of um, endothelial cells uh, by the basement membrane and we have precapillary sphincters uh, and arterioles that control the flow through those capillary beds which provide uh, nutrients and exchange in our, in our organs. Moving right along with the passage of substances we learned in the last video that we have uh, lipid soluble substances, the small water soluble substances and the large water soluble substances, the lipid soluble substances they are able to go through simple diffusion, for example, O2 and CO2, Sam uh, the smaller water-soluble substance like water, glucose, and amino acids are able to get in using those clefts that I talked about in the last video. If any of this sounds a, a little complicated or, or uh, difficult, please go back to the, to the past video. We also talked about the blood-brain barrier and the sinusoids, and the sinusoids which are located in the liver and intestine. Um, and we talked about penocytosis uh, with the large water soluble substance. Okay, now let's jump into this topic of fluid exchange across capillaries. Uh, why is this an important topic? It, it's a very important topic because if it does not work correctly, we get edema. So at the end of this topic, I'm going to be talking about edema and causes and examples of edema. So let's focus here on the four factors that are important in fluid exchange across capillaries. What are these four factors? Number one is the Starley equation, which I will start. That's the first discussion that we're going to be talking about. Then number two is factors that increase filtration, and then we're going to be talking about sample calculations, and uh, the, that will get kind of drive home uh, the whole edema and uh, filtration slash absorption. Then lastly, we'll be talking about lymph. So starting with the Starling equation, and this gets a lot of students and gets asked definitely in all the exam questions that have to do with this topic. So now let's just walk through and see what, what each variable in here stands for. Uh, we'll start with the, the JV, J, JV, which is the fluid flow. flow. So when, when JV, though, is positive, there is a net fluid movement out of the capillary. So when JV is positive, this, if everything here adds to making this positive, this means filtration. And remember this for our question that I'm going to be asking you later uh, in, in this presentation. Now, when JV is negative, which is fluid flow, this means that we have absorption. Okay? So positive is filtration, negative is absorption. Good. Now let's walk through the rest of the um, constants here. We have the KF. What's KF? KF is the what we call filtration coefficient. Uh, this is what just uh, something that we call the hydrolytic uh, uh, conductance, when, uh, which is for water permeability of the capillary wall. And as, as, as it says here, it's a constant. Now, PC, PC here, and then we have PI. Those are important to know, and these are hydrostatic pressure. The pi here is the oncotic pressure. So let's walk, what's the difference between PC and PI? And, pi c and p pi i. The p c is the capillary hydrostatic pressure. Okay, the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary. Therefore, that it's called c. Okay, now an increase in p c favors. What does it favor? It favors filtration. And uh, and that filtration is out of the capillary, as you can imagine. P c is determined by the arterial and venous pressure and the resistances. So if we have an increase in either arterial or venous pressure, this would produce an increased PC. Okay, that makes sense. An increase in venous pressure has a, a greater effect on PC. So we need to remember that uh, increase in venous pressure is the main or the, the bigger effect here on uh, PC in comparison to uh, other increasing or, or decrease in arterial pressure. Now what else do we need to know about PC? We need to know that PC is higher at the arterial end of the capillary than the venous end. Okay? Again, PC is higher at the arterial end of the capillary than at the venous end. 
What are the exceptions to this rule? There's one exception. And this is in the glomerular capillaries where it is constant. So PC in the glomerular capillaries is constant. Okay, let's move on and define the rest of, of the uh, variables here. Uh, PI is the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. So this one was what? What PC again? Was the capillary hydrostatic pressure. Now this is the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. What, what's that? Uh, let's first talk about uh, an increase in, in PI. If we have increase in the interstitial fluid, which is inside, the, an increase in PI will oppose filtration out of the capillary. Okay? And uh, it's normally about zero uh, millimeters per mercury, so it, or it's about slightly negative. Moving to defining the rest of the equation here, pi C is the capillary oncotic, or what we call colloidal osmotic pressure. It's just another fancy word for oncotic. And the, an increase here in PC opposes filtration out of the capillary. Uh, PC is increased by increase in protein concentration in the blood, uh, for example, dehydration. Uh, PC is decreased in situations by decrease of protein uh, concentration in, in, in the blood, such as in, in nephrotic syndrome, such as in protein malnutrition, liver failure, uh, also burns. Okay, so small solutes do not contribute to PC. What's PI? Similar to the pi, uh, uh, sorry, pi I similar to PI. Pi I is the interstitial fluid oncotic pressure. So if we have an increase in pi I, okay, an increase there favors filtration out of the capillary. Pi I is dependent on the protein concentration of the interstitial fluid, which is normally about quite low because there is very little protein filtered here. Okay, so those are the variables and we're gonna walk through factors that increase filtration next and we'll understand this picture a little bit better. So what are the factors that increase filtration? There's four of them. One, if we have an increase in PC, okay, and that can be caused by increased arterial or venous pressure, like I told you, especially the venous pressure has bigger effect, then we're gonna have an increase in filtration. Okay, a decrease in PI, which is opposite of this arrow, would also increase filtration. Okay, a decrease in PC, again opposite of this arrow, would cause filtration. And uh, where, when do we get a, a, a decreased uh, pi C or oncotic, uh, ca uh, oncotic uh, uh, pressure, uh, the capillary oncotic coloosmotic pressure? We get that with uh, decreased protein concentration in the blood, uh, which I gave you an example of uh, in nephrotic syndrome, protein malnutrition, liver failure. Um, and um, uh, I also said in, in burns. Okay, now uh, how about the pi i? Pi i, uh, if that's increased, which is opposite of this arrow, would lead to filtration. And this is caused by inadequate uh, lymph function. I, if I were you, I would sit down and make sure that I understand this. Okay, let's give a, 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 an example. I'm a firm believer that if you do an example, you'll learn it. If you do questions, you'll learn how to do it. Uh, and jump into it. So, here in this example, at the arterial end of the capillary, we have a PC of 30 millimeters of mercury. The pi C is 28 millimeters of mercury. The pi is zero, which we've noticed that's oh, usually zero. And then the uh, the the pi. I don't know if I said pi, pi but pi is zero. And then the pi i is 4 millimeters per mil. Will filtration or absorption occur? So in order to do this, you should plug in. It's just a plug and chug uh, equation. So you just know the equation here is j, v. Here, uh, the constant is, is not given. So we a lot of times just drop it. And then we have the pc. We have the pi minus the pi c minus the Pi I. And that gives us a positive 6 millimeters of mercury. Earlier in the presentation, I told you to remember, if it's positive, it's what? If it's positive, if the net pressure is positive, we have filtration occurring. Excellent. If you got this, good job. Now, the next example, let's talk about uh, the venous end of the same capillary. 
we have PC have decreased to 16 millimeters of mercury. So uh, it, it was 30 millimeters of mercury, now it decreased to 16 millimeters of mercury. The Pi C remained at 28 millimeters of mercury. The Pi I is 0 millimeters of mercury, which is usually 0. And then in the Pi I, th th that was Pi. I mixed the Pi I and Pi I, but you know what I mean. Pi I is 0. Then the Pi I is 4 millimeters of mercury. So will the filtration or absorption occur? Again, plug and chug everything, and then we get negative 8. What does negative 8 tell us? Because if the vent pressure is negative, absorption will occur. Okay? So, reminder, positive, uh, negative absorption occurs, positive filtration occurs. Okay? Moving along, we will be talking now about the lymph, which is the fourth uh, topic that I wanted to discuss in fluid exchange across the capillaries. Uh, in lymph, we have uh, three topics that I want to talk about. Function of the lymph, what's the lymph, what's the function of it, the unidirectional flow of the lymph, and finally I'll end with edema and then examples of edema. So lymph, the function of lymph uh, normally is to uh, filter fluids out of the capillaries. So remember the capillary and our discussion of the capillary, how we had fluid you know, getting into the capillary, we have an exchange, and then there's fluid that remains, or we pick up some fluid, and then it goes out of the capillary, and then we have more fluid. And if we don't, if we're not able to have, if we don't have a system to take care of that fluid, then where would that fluid go? It will just pool there, and then we get edema. That's bad. So that's why the lymph is very important. Uh, and uh, the filtration, like I said, it normally filters fluid out of the capillaries, and it's slightly greater than the absorption of fluid into the capillaries. So the excess filter fluid is returned to the circulation via the lymph. Okay? Lymph also returns any filter protein to circulation. So it's very important. It's returning stuff okay? to, uh, to the circulation and picking up trash or picking up extra fluid that is we don't need in the capillaries or in, in the in, uh, uh, upstream. Okay, now Second thing I want to talk about is the unidirectional flow. What's up with the unidirectional flow? It's we have uh, valves in, in in the lymph, and these are called one-way flap valves, and these permit interstitial fluid to enter but not leave the lymph vessels. So the flow through these larger lymph lymphatic vessels is also unidirectional. So it's very important to know, and this aids by the one. This is aided by the one valves and the skeletal muscles in contraction. So if the valves are very important in the directionality, but also we need to make sure that our, our skeletal muscles are contracting. So that's why it's, if a patient is just sitting in bed for a long time, that's not a good thing because they can develop edema and then they can develop DVT and then they can get PE and it's a complication. That's why when we have patients in our hospitals that are able to walk, then we do it and then in surgeries, we have those compressions on their legs in order to make sure that we don't develop edema and don't develop uh, PE at the end. That's why it's very important. So the valves on their own are not the only thing that can take care of uh, with the movement of the lymph, but we also need our skeletal muscles contraction. Okay, finally let's talk about edema. My favorite subject here. So edema, when does it happen? I kind of alluded to uh, throughout the presentation. It occurs when the volume of the interstitial fluid exceeds the capillary of the lymphatics to return to the circulation. Okay, so if there is more fluid that cannot be picked up by the lymphatic system, uh, which returns into the cir uh, into circulation, then we will have uh, extra fluid, and that causes edema. Uh, it can be caused by excess filtration. So if we have excess filtration out of the capillary here, or if we have blocked lymphatic. So imagine here the lymphatic, where my air is at. If this lymphatic that's supposed to pick up the extra fluid from here is blocked, then it cannot pick up that fluid. Okay, what are some causes of edema? And let's give examples. So let's just, uh, I mean, it, it makes intuitive sense if we, walk, if we remember the equation. If we have increased uh, the uh, PC here, then we have increased fluid filtration. What are examples of that? Arterial dil di dilatation or dilation. And that will, uh, when you dilate the arterioles, you have more fluids. Venous constriction. Constrict the venous, then you have more fluid leaking out the capillary. Increased venous pressure. Heart failure is the 
number like very clinical thing that we see in our patients and we usually check for edema and see if there is any pitting edema here we have extracellular fluid expansion you know, and just to back up a little bit heart failure where does it make sense because if the heart is not able to pump the way it's supposed to pumps so it's a whole it's a whole circuit so the circuit is messed up and if the circuit is messed up then we cannot uh, have the circulation ongoing so we have built up a fluid somewhere and pools where and there by the capillaries and that's where we get edemas everywhere and usually we notice in the legs and the, and the hands first so we have also uh, some other causes of increased uh, uh, the, the PC uh, or uh, the capillary hydrostatic pressure is extracellular volume expansion uh, standing uh, edema is uh, independent is in the dependent limbs. So if we stand for a long time, like those soldiers that are in England, they they cannot just stand there guarding the palace. They walk and they they do their own thing so that they don't get edema. So if you remember this example, you understand why uh, the soldiers don't just stand there. They're always marching, going back and forth, uh, so that they don't get edema. I don't know if they know that. Okay. Uh, a decrease uh, in um, pi C or the capillary oncotic pressure uh, that also can cause edema. Uh, and uh, what are examples of that? Decreased plasma protein concentration. If we don't have uh, protein, then we will have fluid leaking out. Severe liver diseases such as failure to synthesize proteins, which is kind of along the same line of the decreased plasma protein. So we have the decreased protein and the liver is compromised, then we're going to have edema. So protein malnutrition, uh, and you see, uh, you've seen the picture of little kids in Africa with big bellies. And, and when they have protein malnutrition, they have like uh, an edema in their, in their abdomen, which is not because they're eating a lot. It's just because of the uh, fluid getting out due to low protein because these kids are poor and they, they don't have a high rich protein diet. Uh, moving on, we have the nephrotic syndrome where we have loss of protein in urine. That's terrible, really bad. You can, usually protein should not be in the urine. As you can imagine, we filter in the glomerular to make sure that it does not get in the urine. Okay, last thing here, this KF, which is like not talked about a lot, but if we have, it's a constant, right? It's a constant that we call the filtration coefficient. But if we have this increased, such as in burns or inflammation, then that what does that do to our equation? It makes it positive. So in, uh, we're making this positive, the side of the equation positive, uh, of the KF, we review the equation, then you will get what? You will get filtration, so you have edema. Inflammation is around the same reason because of the histamine release and cytokine release. Okay, let's talk about the fourth topic here, uh, which is the endothelium derived relaxing factor, and this would end our discussion of the microcirculation and lymph. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, it's important to note that the endothelium relaxing factors, those are released by what? By the capillaries. Remember, the capillaries, I told you, they have endothelium cells and do not have smooth muscles. Okay? So endothelium cells, uh, releasing factors, those are produced in the endothelial cells of the capillaries or uh, of, in general, uh, like in all of our body, we have those uh, produced, those relaxing factors produced. They cause what? 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 What's the importance of them? They cause local relaxation of vascular smooth muscles. Okay, so we get the relaxation of vascular smooth muscles. Okay, what's the mechanism of action? How does this thing work? The mechanism of action it involves the activation of guanylate cyclase and the production of cyclic guanosine monophosphate or CGMP. So CGMP here is very important in playing a role of uh, increasing uh, endothelial relaxation. And also, it's notable to know here, with the sildenafil, sildenafil, what it does, sildenafil of Viagra, what it does is it increases CGMP. And how does it increase that? It increases it by binding to uh, an enzyme that usually will break this. So when the Viagra binds to that enzyme, it tells it, hey, stop stop breaking that CGMP. We want the CGMP in order to relax, rela have relaxing factors. And that's what also gives us the other side effect 
that are popular in men that use Viagra. Okay, uh, also the last thing is the nitric oxide. Nitric oxide um, is one of the forms of the um, endothelial derived relaxant factor, kind of similar to CGMP, that's also released by the endothelium. Um, also notable to know that circulating acetylcholine uh, causes vasodilation. So acetylcholine, do we remember where acetylcholine is released from? Okay. It causes vasodilation by stimulating the production of nitric oxide in vascular smooth muscle. The answer to what I just asked, that acetylcholine is released by the parasympathetic system. Okay. So it causes vasodilation by stimulating what? The nitric oxide in the vascular smooth muscle. And this ends our discussion of microcirculation and lymph. I appreciate your feedback or questions, and I'll try to answer them.